Welcome everybody to the Cloud Online Meetup. Today's topic is the latest on OpenStack Trough and the upcoming Kilo release. And we are approaching one year since the Trough project moved out of incubation and became fully fledged part of OpenStack. And the upcoming Kilo release features a number of improvements that enhance existing capabilities from Icehouse or Juno along with others that are new. Today's speaker is going to be Amrit Kumar, who is the CTO of Tesora and the Trough core team member, and he will share what you can expect to see in the OpenStack Trough Kilo release coming in April. Before we get started, a few logistics. If you have any questions, feel free to ask those use the, um, using the chat window on the left-hand side of the web panel. And this session is going to be recorded, and the recording is going to be available roughly within the next 48 hours. And with that, let me hand over to Amrit. Amrit, the stage is yours. Thank you, Rafael. Thank you for organizing these meetups. And uh, hello to everybody who's on the uh, who's on this meetup. Um, as Rafael mentioned, we'll be uh, taking questions along the way. Um, so if you have questions, uh, shoot them right in, and we'll try and get to them uh, either immediately or um, keep related questions towards the end. Um, as Rafael mentioned, I'm. I'm a member of the Trove core team and um, have been a technical contributor to Trove for about the past year. This presentation is going to start with a little bit of an overview of what Trove is because there may be a couple of you who have not uh, worked, with, worked with or worked on Trove before. And then we'll go into details of what's new in Kilo, which is going to be the meat of this presentation. For those of you who are familiar with OpenStack, Trove is the OpenStack project whose mission is to provide the database as a service capability for people operating OpenStack in either their private or public clouds. A database as a service is a uh, capability which allows people to easily operate a database, and that may be a relational database, that may be a, a NoSQL database easily through all phases of that database's life cycle. This is intended to make it such that people can spend their time uh, focusing on innovation in their project areas rather than spending their time on things like managing and configuring and provisioning databases or maintaining them when something happens. And it is something which has been shown to dramatically improve productivity for development and uh, development organizations and IT organizations alike. So Trove's mission statement is to give you the ability to operate a reliable and scalable database as a service capability for both relational and non-relational database engines. Um, just from a perspective of comparison, if you're not familiar with um, database as a service, Think Amazon RDS. Um, Amazon RDS is database as a service for relational databases. Um, similarly, there's things like Heroku, which give you some such capabilities. Uh, I noticed that somebody raised their hand. Uh, I'm, I'll wave to you, but if you have a question, go ahead and type it in, and we'll we'll get to it um, as soon as we can. <coughs> um, and of course, there's a link there which shows you where you can get to uh, where you can get to uh, this mission statement. Um, so, uh, thank you. The question was uh, where? What about uh, AWS uh, Simple DB? I believe. Um, so, a very important distinction between between Amazon um, Amazon's database and service capabilities and Trove is that. Trove intends to provide users with a simple and consistent interface to both relational and non-relational databases. Um, in OpenStack Trove, there is currently no support for SimpleDB, but uh, there is support for a number of NoSQL databases. And as we'll talk later in this presentation, one of the things which makes um, makes it a whole lot easier with OpenStack is the ability to add a data store. So we'll talk about that in a second. Um, I 
I noticed that you posted a link to a question. I'm I will I'll get back to you with an answer to the question offline um, rather than try and read the question right here. Um, so what are some highlights of Trove? It's a database as a service project like we just talked about. Um, currently, Trove supports Mongo, Cassandra, Couch, Redis. Um, there will soon be support for CouchDB as well. We'll talk more about that. Um, there's support for a bunch of relational databases, MySQL and Postgres. Uh, and there's going to be support for other relational databases pretty soon as well. Um, and one of the benefits of this mechanism of uh, Trove is that it stays entirely or almost entirely on the management plane. So if you think about a database in, a, in, in an IT environment, there's the capability for you to provision and manage and operate the database itself. And then there's the application which interacts with the database. So we make a distinction between the data plane and the management plane, and Trove almost entirely stays on the management plane. You can provision a database. You can resize the instance. You can uh, do a whole bunch of things with it. You can make sure it's up and running. The only two cases where um, Trove gets into the data plane are in the area of backup and restore, and by extension, when you want to instantiate a database based on a backup, um, Trove is in the data plane to the extent that the data travels through it. But Trove, as a matter of policy, has no access to your data. Therefore, you can operate uh, Trove in a public cloud environment, and several people do, um, and the operators of the cloud do not have access to your data. They only uh, are able to see that you have a certain number of instances and they can do things like billing. Similarly, in your private cloud environment, it means that you have an IT organization and then you have some confidential data in your database, then you can have the proper protections around your data as well. Trove is in the management plane. Your data plane is still whatever is provided by your database. Um, we'll talk about support for other databases in a couple of slides. Um, very quick history of uh, Trove, as, uh, as Raphael mentioned. Um, Trove was, um, it came out of, uh, came out of the, it came out of the incubation process in, in, into integration into OpenStack in the Ice House release, which is a year ago in April, or it's actually not even been a year now. Um, the original work on Trove began a long time before that, um, and it was it was done mostly by HP and Rackspace. And uh, I'm sorry, there's a typo on that slide. We should fix that. It's uh, HP and Rackspace as the project called Red Dwarf. And when it came out, um, when it came out in Ice House, it uh, it was. It had support for MySQL, and uh, it had support for Mongo, and uh, the ability, the capabilities which you had with these databases, and we'll talk about this uh, a little bit later, um, were rather rudimentary. And over the past year, there has been a rapid improvement in um, in the capabilities available for various databases, and now. Um, actually, a couple of months ago in, in the Juno release, which was in October, um, we added support for MySQL replication. Our friends from eBay added support for Mongo clustering. There was support added for Postgres by um, friends at Rackspace. And we're continuing down that path, and we'll talk more about what's coming in Kilo. But Trove is a rapidly evolving project. Um, just a quick history lesson for those of you who aren't familiar with the project. Um, a very short description of the architecture of Trove. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about this, but it's important to understand that Trove is a uh, is an OpenStack project, but it's also a client of a lot of the other OpenStack projects in that it builds on existing OpenStack projects. So if you had, and and just in terms of the layout of this slide. Um, the services on the right-hand side of this picture in the box labeled OpenStack um, are, are your core
Oracle OpenStack Services. The box on the left, uh, Trove or Tesoro Database as a Service uh, platform, are basically the Trove components. So if you have an OpenStack deployment, you have Nova, you have Cinder, Swift, Glance, Keystone, and Neutron. Um, and your identity management with Trove is going to come from the exact same place um, where um, you, it would for the rest of your OpenStack deployment. Uh, Neutron is still used for networking. You could still use Nova Networking if that's what you're doing. Um, guest images are stored in GLANs. Uh, storage is provided by Cinder and Swift. And, um, and Nova is the compute instance uh, capability. Um, and Trove as a, Trove as a service um, is a client of all of these. So if somebody were to come along and, and, ask, um, and ask for a new instance, then Trove is going to then Trove is going to be able to provision an instance out of compute with Nova, uh, allocate storage from Cinder and Swift, and um, pre pre baked images for Trove are available in Glance, uh, and those images will have you know the best practices for whatever database you have built into them. So, if you were to come along and request a a MongoDB instance of Trove, then a image from Glance is booted onto a compute instance of the right size, storage is associated with it from Cinder, and you will then have a database instance which you can use. And Trove, again, as you can see from this picture, stays entirely in the area of um, the management plane and doesn't get involved in the data plane. Um, I noticed there's a question about um, a Trove and support for other databases and where it is in terms of maturity. Uh, I will get to those. I have a slide which, um, which, uh, which talks about that in detail, so we'll, we'll hold that question for a couple of minutes. Um, and just in terms of the ecosystem for Trove, it's important to understand just like the architecture slide, Trove is a client of many of the OpenStack services, uh, Trove is also a little bit different from all the other OpenStack projects in one respect, and that is that there are a number of databases out there, and we list several here, um, and there are several vendors who have OpenStack distributions, but there is a, there is such a large number of each of these that if you were to try and just take OpenStack and try and pick a database, um, and, that, and that database may be running on one of the many operating systems which are available here, it could be Ubuntu, it could be Red Hat, um, there is a number of combinations involved. And, and part of the complexity of Trove is this many-to-many -many, uh, multiplicative or combinatorial problem of how many different combinations there are in which people can use it. Now, that's a flexibility thing. It's also an issue in terms of the code complexity and part of the architecture where uh, Trove has been architected in such a way as to be able to try and deal with this, and we'll talk about that uh, in a couple of slides. But just wanted to give you a flavor for what the Trove ecosystem is because uh, this ecosystem is very interesting because there's a significant number of new databases in, in the killer release, in the killer release, which we'll talk about. Um, also important to note that Trove is a vibrant project with contributions from a significant number of companies. Um, these are the commits in Trove to date. Um, of course, there's there's a, there's still several months before Kilo comes out. Uh, you can notice contributions from um, Tesora, where I work, uh, HP, Rackspace, eBay, um, Red Hat, a whole bunch of um, contributions from a whole bunch of companies here. And this is effectively the ecosystem of players in um, intro. So talking about how Trove can 
deal with this number of databases and number of operating systems, it's important to understand that the way Trove is architected, there's a significant amount of code which is database agnostic, and there is some code which is database specific, and an attempt has been made to separate these two out. So the database agnostic code, or in, in, uh, in Trove terminology, data store agnostic code, uh, that is either in the controller or in some cases in the dashboard. So no matter what database it is you're trying to provision, there's a certain set of steps which you have to take. You need to provision a Nova instance. You need to provision storage. Uh, those are all in the Trove controller code. And if you're familiar with an OpenStack deployment, uh, your Trove controller can run either along with your other controllers or you could have the Trove controller running in a Nova VM on uh, some other machine. But for each of the data stores you wish to offer, you have a guest agent. Now, the Trove controller exposes a, uh, a data store agnostic API, and it's up to the guest agent to provide the implementation of that API for each specific database. So um, I, I noticed there was a question from somebody about Oracle, so you notice Oracle is on this list. Um, we recently announced uh, support for Oracle. Um, as part of our Tesora version 1.3 of the product, which is uh, based on Trove, but I'll get to that in more detail. Uh, SQL Server is something which we're working on. It's not yet in, uh, in the release state, but if you're interested in SQL Server, um, send me an email. My contact information is on the last slide, and I'll hook you up with something. Um, so the way in which Trove is architected it's expandable and easy to add additional data stores. Uh, the number of things which you have to do are 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 limited, but you have to you have to basically implement a guest agent and make sure that the database agnostic code is going to be able to support whatever data store you're adding. Um, I'm going to pause for a bit and see if there's more questions and uh, move on to the uh, move on to the next slide. And there was a question about whether Trove was ready for production or not, so I'm going to um, try and address that question here. Um, I believe that Trove is at this point a rapidly evolving project, and depending on what it is you're looking to do, uh, Trove may be able to do it for you. Um, there are people who operate Trove in production. Um, private clouds at, at eBay use Trove. Um, uh, CERN, we understand, uses Trove. They've talked about it at, um, at the OpenStack summits, and you see some postings by people at uh, CERN about it. And there are, there are at least uh, two public clouds um, that are using Trove from the upstream, and then there's Bluebox, which is using uh, the Trove distribution which Tesoro provides. Um, and these are available and these are operating in production with a number of databases and number of users each. So if you were to use the Rackspace Cloud Database, you are in fact using a Trove system. If you're using HP's Helion Cloud, it has Trove under the covers. Um, and similarly with Bluebox. So we'll talk some more about um, the future of Trove and you know, production readiness and uh, applicability to any specific use case you may have uh, in mind in a couple of slides. Um, so to the que person who asked this question, uh, this is a partial answer. I'm going to come back to your question. Um, you also had a question about distributions of Trove, and I'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Um, so let's, now with a uh, background of what Trove is and a brief history of Trove. Let's talk about what's new in Kilo. Um, so we'll talk about we'll we'll start by talking about uh, what happened in Juno. Um, these are the numbers from Juno of um, of of you know activity there. So I was saying earlier this is a actively developed project. You can see that. You can see that from these numbers. These numbers, by the way, came from an article which uh, was written a while ago in uh, SuperUser. Um, and again, the number of contributors is uh, 
is significant. This is not this is not a uh, this is not a project with a small number of contributors. There's rapid development. We'll talk about some of these blueprints and so on and so forth. But um, there is there is a um, there's a number of changes which are coming in Kilo, which is going to be the the um, the focus of this presentation. Now, in in Juno, we um, we made a change, and uh, this this slide, by the way, is probably more of interest to developers and people who are looking to contribute to Trove or people who are interested in other OpenStack projects. Um, with the with the rate of change we had in Trove, we decided that we would move away from the spec review process, which we had been using, and we decided to put our blueprints on a wiki page. Um, seemed like a good idea at the time. It didn't work as we expected. Um, and so in the, in the mid-cycle meetup, which we held in, um, in Cambridge uh, in October, November, and in the summit in Paris, we decided that once Juno came out, we were going to switch back to the old Garrett review process. Um, what this means for you as a as a developer is that if you want to if you want to review a blueprint or a spec for Trove, you do that in uh, Git review just as you would for a uh, source change. What it means for you if you're an end user is you can look at what's going on in Trove by just following the Trove project in uh, in Launchpad or uh, subscribing to the Garrett review system and watching changes in the Trove specs repository. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with that, uh, you can clone the Git repository for Trove from either github.com or from openstack.org. And if you look in the Trove specs repository, you will see all the projects which are currently being worked on or which have been proposed for inclusion either in this release or the next. So this is a change we made. It's been working well so far. I think we're going to keep the same thing for the L release as well. Um, all right, so let's pause here for a second and and talk about data store improvements. Now, by design, Trove intended to be able to support multiple databases. Um, the initial databases which were supported, or the initial database which was supported was MySQL. Um, and subsequently, before Trove came out of incubation, in, in the Icehouse release, uh, Trove supported MySQL, uh, Cassandra, Redis, Couch, and Mongo. Um, in all of these cases, it supported single instance data stores. We'll talk some more about that in a couple of slides. But basically what that means is that in the Icehouse release, there was a guest agent for each of those databases. In the Kilo release, uh, there is going to be support for two new databases, uh, CouchDB and Vertica. For those of you who are not familiar with uh, CouchDB, it's the uh, Cloudant product from IBM. Uh, a couple of slides ago, you noticed that there were several contributions from IBM. This is one of them. Uh, and for those of you who are not familiar with Vertica, it's a massively parallel column-oriented database um, from HP. Um, both of these are going to be available. Uh, the plan is to have both of these available in the Kilo release. In addition, um, there is code which has been submitted, and we're working through the details of, of exactly how to incorporate it. There, there should be, and I noticed that I, I said should, there should be support for the DB2 database in the Kilo release as well. Uh, for those of you who are interested, changes for this have been submitted. Um, and there has also been uh, an addition of an Oracle database, and I'm going to mention that here, that the Oracle database support is not currently in the OpenStack distribution of Trove. It's available in Tesoro's distribution of Trove, a distinction which I'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, hitherto, Trove supported only open source databases. Um, one thing which you'll notice is common with MySQL, Postgres, Cassandra, Redis, Couch, and Mongo is they're all open source. Um, but in the Kilo release, you're going to see support for some closed source databases as well. 
And just for purists who might be asking the question when I say MySQL, what do I mean? Uh, it's MySQL, it's Percona, it's MariaDB, it's any derivative of MySQL. Um, conspicuous by its absence on this supported set of data stores right now is SQL Server. But again, if you're interested in SQL Server, let me know and I'll hook you up with, uh, with some of that. The other important thing which we're doing, and this is something which is a, uh, an improvement from the uh, development and debugging perspective. When you spin up a database instance, that database instance is a virtual machine. It's a Nova instance. And the guest image for it typically would disable shell access. So if that were the case, then debugging this instance would be difficult. And there needs to be a way for you to get access to just the system error log files. Um, for those of you who are familiar with RDS, they've implemented a mechanism by which you can see the log file as a table with MySQL, and they've come up with other mechanisms for other databases. OpenStack similarly is, um, is offering these um, log files for Trove images uh, through an API. The API is going to be uh, implemented, and we hope at least a MVP for the API will be in Kilo. Um, a uh, quick aside, there was a question about are these slides going to be available for uh, download? Absolutely. Um, there was a typo which I pointed out earlier. We'll fix that and we'll make the slides available uh, once that's done. Um, so moving along, so after talking about data store, now let's start talking about other specific database features. Uh, two important classes of features which we're going to talk about are replication and clustering. Um, when Trove adds support for a database, typically the first thing you add is support for single instance data stores. So in Icehouse, you could spin up a single instance of MySQL or Mongo or any of the other databases. In the Juno release, one of the things which we worked on was to build a replication framework. Again, uh, Trove is a multi-database project. Therefore, we couldn't just come up with a mechanism to do replication for MySQL and call it a done deal. So we built a framework which we, built, which we felt would support uh, multiple databases moving forward. And in the Juno release, we came up with not only the framework, but also a MySQL replication based on that framework. In the Kilo release, we're extending on that, and um, we're going to have support for additional replication capabilities. Uh, MySQL, as you know, 5.6 supports GTID-based replication, which gives you some additional capabilities. And we're going to leverage those to make it such that in the Kilo release, you can have uh, support for MySQL replication, and you can also have a failover. Um, Juno had no failover. Kilo has manual failover, and automated failover is likely to be in a release later. Um, also, there was a a, um, the Horizon Dashboard is an independent project from Trove, and the code changes for replication, which didn't make it in time for Juno, are going to be part of Kilo at this point. Um, in a very similar vein, um, in Juno, we continued to build on uh, the capabilities from, of Trove. We started with single instance Mongo, but Nobody would want to operate Mongo other than in a multi uh, in a multi node configuration. So in Juno, we had support for Mongo clusters, and you could you could do a trove create and create a cluster uh, with Mongo. In Kilo, we're going to continue to extend on that framework and had support for Cassandra clustering. That work is already underway. Uh, those of you who are interested in giving it a shot code's up for review, so if you want to download it and try it, go for it. Um, it is still planned, and we're still hoping we're going to land some code with uh, Percona XDB cluster or Galera. Um, that, is, that is still a plan, and I'm, I'm not sure whether that's going to happen or not. Um, I'm sorry, I was talking to the wrong slide. Uh, so. I'll just quickly go over that again. In Juno, we built out clustering with MongoDB. And in, 
in, in, in Kilo, we have uh, additional support for clustering as well. Um, if you have other questions about this, now is the time to uh, now is the time to ask. Anybody? All right. One of the things which we noticed along the way is we were moving at 100 miles an hour and um, rapidly adding capabilities to Trove, and we were as, as part of that. It, it seemed like there was a significant amount of technical debt which we were accumulating. Um, two very significant areas where we were um, where we needed to do some cleanup was in the area of CI and testing, uh, and in the area of integration with Oslo. Um, if you're not familiar with Oslo, it's the OpenStack Common Libraries framework, and um, most OpenStack projects are um, dependent in some degree on Oslo for a whole bunch of things. The Oslo development process starts with a module in Oslo Incubator. And Trove, which started off a while ago on development, was dependent on a whole bunch of modules in Oslo Incubator. Um, we went through Icehouse, we went through Juno, and we realized that there was a backlog building here. And as several modules in Oslo Incubator were either deprecated or graduated, we needed to deal with them. Um, I mentioned earlier that the Trove community is an active and vibrant community. Um, we at Tesora did a bunch of the work on this Oslo uh, migration. Um, but our friends from Red Hat picked up an enormous burden of this in the, um, in the Kilo release, and they helped with uh, a significant module that's Oslo messaging, and we're able to say at this point that um, Trove is up to date on the shared modules from Oslo. Um, and there was a whole bunch of housekeeping. We were using a, um, a, a somewhat outdated CI system, and we upgraded that. Um, we're going to continue to improve that in the in the L release as well, but we can honestly say that the CI, which we operate as part of the standard OpenStack gate at this point, is much more robust in the Kilo release than it was before. Um, again, all of these things are probably of less interest to you if you're a user of OpenStack, but if you're a developer or a person who wants to integrate it or an early adopter of OpenStack, um, these are things which you would care about. And finally, in the area of improvements, there was a lot of feedback which we received on on documentation uh, or the lack thereof. And um, so two of the things which we specifically focused on were in the area of documenting how you build a guest image um, and a bunch of improved end user documentation. We have, we have some excellent tech writers who are working on, on the latter, um, improved end user documentation. And I'm still on the hook for delivering the first one, and I'm I'm a little bit behind on that. I'm hoping it's going to be done by Kilo. At least there will be a draft of that. Um, if any of you has questions about how to build a guest image uh, to use with Trove, and you find the documentation in Trove is lacking, uh, you know whom to blame. Um, so that's a quick review of the kinds of things which we're talking about in Trove. Uh, I'm going to change gears a little bit and talk about Trove from the perspective of an enterprise and uh, why, where we see Trove from an enterprise perspective. Um, I'm going to talk about that in the context of uh, the database as a service platform which we at Tesora offer. It's basically a database as a service platform built on top of OpenStack Trove. And for the most part, in, a, in an enterprise, we see this as being um, like the Coke machine on the right. Uh, you punch a button and you get your can of Coke. You punch a button and you get the database you want. One of the uh, major problems which we are trying to address with Trove and we're trying to address with the DBAS platform is that end users would like to have a easy uh, self-provisioning, self-managing database infrastructure across a whole bunch of databases, not just SQL or NoSQL, where you have automation for 
standard management activity. So that's basically what we're trying to deliver. And um, I, I'm going to maybe pause a little bit on this slide because there were several questions I noticed about Trill from the point of view of readiness and Trill from the point of view of applicability in an enterprise. Um, there's a there's a community edition of Trove, um, which you can get. You can download it. Um, but if you wanted to actually operate Trove in production, you would look to uh, a distribution of Trove. And there are se several OpenStack distributions include Trove at this point. Um, the one which I'm most familiar with is our own. And we offer a community and an enterprise edition with, with specific capabilities, which are tailored towards what you plan to do with uh, with with Tro. Uh, we give you certified guest images for you know all of your open source databases. We continuously test them, make them available to you, bug fixes, um, and and more testing than is available in the gate. Uh, but we also give you support in our enterprise edition for proprietary databases. So um, as an organization, we're focused solely on Tro. We do not operate Trove as a service. We're not a service provider in that regard. We're strictly a product company focused on Trove, and that focus shows in the offerings we have. So if you're looking to offer Trove within your enterprise or as part of a public cloud offering which you want to operate, um, definitely please talk to us. Um, and last but not least, there were some questions about Trove from the perspective of uh, a maturity model. Uh, when Trove started off, uh, it was it was single instance data stores, uh, which at the bottom of this slide were deployment in development or testing use cases. Um, you could you could do basic things with it. You could create an instance. You could resize the instance. You could do full backup and restore and things like that. Um, a typical user of a service would graduate from uh, development into production, and when you want to migrate a database from development to production, you have a different set of requirements of that database. You're going to require scheduled operations and you know uh, operations which happen on a schedule automatically. You want backups to happen automatically. Um, that is currently a capability which is not in Trove. We're hoping it's going to land in in the Kilo release. I didn't put it on my list because it's one which may not. And and similarly similarly there are things like replication. You would not operate a database in production unless you had a higher level of availability than a single instance. You didn't want a single point of failure. Uh, Trove started from the point of view of uh, a development test use case in, in the pre Ice House and Ice House years and rapidly over the last year there are several use cases which have the capabilities which you would need if you want to run a production system. And over time, we're going to, we're going to continue to improve the, the capabilities of Trove and contribute them back to the community version where you have the ability to run Trove on bare metal if you need to, with advanced monitoring or additional capabilities in the area of you know, a multi-region deployment, such that you're able to actually operate Trove in production for a, uh, for a mature enterprise. Also, in the same vein, um, there are a lot of use cases for MySQL and Mongo and um, the other databases supported by Trove. But enterprises demand other databases as well. And that's one of the reasons why we're offering support for Oracle. Um, we just announced it a couple of, uh, maybe a week ago. And we're working on support for other databases as well. Over time, the, 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 the goal is that you will be able to pick any database which you want in your enterprise, and you will be able to get a production-ready guest agent, a production-ready guest image, and be able to spark that up in Trove with, uh, with the same ease of use as any other database. Uh, unlike other databases of service offerings where there's a database as a service offering for relational databases and a totally different database as a service offering for non-relational databases. So our goal is to bring Trove to the point where you have a single seamless experience for all of your database assets. So that's where Trove is headed, and I think we 
started in the ice house and pre-ice house uh, time frame in the development use cases, we're now clearly for several data stores in the production use cases and moving quickly towards you know the zero time downtime carrier uh, carrier grade uh, use cases. So that's all the slides I had. I promise contact information if you want to get in touch with me, and uh, I'll make sure that the slides are made available to Rafael uh, very shortly after this presentation, so you'll be able to download them from him. Um, I noticed that there's a couple of people who asked for the slides. If we can, uh, if if we find, actually, I think we will we'll be able to email them to you directly. Um, um, so, or the other option is we'll put it up on our blog, uh, tesora.com/blog. You'll be able to get it there as well. If you have other questions, now's the time. Let me just read through the scroll back here and make sure I address all of them. Thank, thank you so much for the presentation, Amrit. I um, <clears throat> went through all the questions while you were presenting. So I think there are no questions unanswered. Um, in case any of you guys um, joining us live, uh, in, in case you have any questions, feel free to ask them now. Uh, so let's maybe wait for another one or two minutes. And as uh, Amrit said, let me let me spell that out again. It's T E S O R A, like uh, like the domain on my email address. Uh, dot com slash blog to the gentleman who asked the question. You have an extra T in the middle there, which is probably why it didn't go there. It didn't go to the right place. Actually, I don't know where that domain would go. I'm going to try that out. Uh, we will we will get the uh, presentation up there uh, very shortly. Um, Oh yes, I find another question. Is there uh, open stack equivalent or plans for AWS Simple DB? Um, I'm not. I'm not sure there's a specific plan for a Simple DB. Um, so, so here's here's a a distinction which is probably worth making. I don't know how this is going to work if we go back on slides. Can we go back on slides? Let me tell you which slide I'd like to go back to. It's uh, in the way back. It's that one. Uh, three. Yeah. Um, if somebody would just wave and tell me you're seeing a slide which says Trove highlights, that would be great. Uh, I mentioned early on, Trove wants to stay entirely and totally in the management. <coughs> um, the SimpleDB is not a good analog to a database as a service. SimpleDB is something which is a database as a service offering which gets into the data plane. There is a different project <coughs> in OpenStack which wants to do uh, something similar to SimpleDB. I believe it's called MagnetoDB. Um, there was a presentation about MagnetoDB at, at Trove Day uh, in October of last year. Um, if you go to tesora.com slash blog, you can see the presentations about Trove Day, and you can look for the presentation uh, by Keith Neustadt of Symantec about MagnetoDB, but that's more of an analog to SimpleDB than Trove is. Now, if you want to offer something similar to SimpleDB on, uh, on the OpenStack platform and you want to use Trove for it, uh, the guest agent implementation for whatever database you want is what you would have to write. If there's, if there's sufficient interest in the community, I'm sure that there will be people in the community who would be interested in doing that. If that's something which you're interested in specifically, uh, I'm happy to chat with you about helping you with that as well. Um, I hope that answers the question about, about SimpleDB. Um, Rafael, do you think that addressed the question? Yes, it definitely does. Thank, thank, thank you very much for answering it. Um, okay, and uh, 